Hi, good, uh, good morning, to, uh, everybody. We have five speakers because uh, the last speaker from last BINA session is going to speak now. So anybody, uh, I would like to welcome you to the IC BINA. Uh, my name is uh, Sefi, Dr. Sefi Lobel. I'm an internal medicine physician from Los Angeles. And I'm honored to be part of this uh, wonderful organization here at the IAC. I'm an IAC lead member, which is a young professional leadership program of the IAC in Los Angeles. Our goal is to strengthen the Israeli-American young professional community to form lasting bonds and ensuring the future of the IAC. I would like to uh, introduce Bina and how these sessions will be held in a salon-style format. Uh, due to the success of our Bina LA, uh, we are expanding to other regions across the country where the IAC is active. We're going to have five speakers today, uh, about 12 minutes uh, to speak, and later on we'll have some uh, question and answer session. Uh, so we encourage you to uh, ask the speakers questions uh, afterwards. Uh, so we have five speakers. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Dror uh, Eidar, a columnist from uh, Israel Ayom. Uh, then we have Philippa Sulin, a communication researcher and political analyst. Uh, Dr. Edith El, founder and CEO of Globaloria. Jake Schwartz, CEO and co-founder of General Assembly and Elisa Klein, Founding Executive Director of One Table. So we'll start with our uh, first uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Dror Eidar. He's a communist from uh, Israel Hayom. Uh, Dr. Dror Eidar serves as a leading communist, uh, columnist in Israel Hayom. Columnist. Columnist. Not, not columnist. 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 Right. Leading communist. The, the guy who prepared this was from uh, a daily newspaper and a popular lecturer in Israel and throughout the world. Uh, what else? Uh, he's a PhD in Hebrew and in Jewish literature from Bar Ilan University. He also studied five years in high, uh, high yeshiva and served as a combat medic like me in the Golani Brigade. He has taught at a number of in universities and colleges in Israel and has published hundreds of articles and essays on polit politics and popular culture, religion, history, myth, language, book reviews, and criticism in many journals and newspapers. So we'll uh, have to all speak. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> all right. Follow my uh, writing, and otherwise I, I won't be able to tell something in this short time. So I was asked to give a, about 12 minutes speech about archaeology and the story of Israel. <laughs> So it's a very Jewish thing, shoving thousands of years into a drop of uh, water. <laughs> but uh, there is a lot of aspects to archaeology. Generally, it's about physically touching ancient material, structure, fragments of pottery and metal, inscription, graves, um, and more. History particularly ancient history, is mostly silent. Very little of it is written, written down. Archaeology helps reconstruct the past. For us as Jews, reconstructing the past isn't a matter for a museum to handle. We are, we are not sitting uh, and watching a historic play. We are part of it. To understand this, let's think about archaeology in other fields, such as archaeology of text or language. What is a word? The word is a symbol that indicates the symbolized or a signifier of the signifier. What happens when the word can refer to more than one thing? What happens when it's an ancient word that has existed 3,000 years? Words like these are like the tips of icebergs. Their contempor contemporary meaning is just the uppermost layer. If we dig in the words, we discover all the layers of meaning. We might find in other periods that the word meant exactly 
the opposite of what it does now. Think about Hebrew. Anyone who speaks this ancient language is unconsciously getting the past to speak and awakening the immense space of knowledge and meanings and traditions amassed within the language. If we enter a Beit Midrash, for example, a place of Jewish learning, we will discover, even if we don't understand what they're speaking about, but if you listen to the grammar of the language, we, we will discover that the linguistic verbs uttered therein are an intermediate present. Rabbi Akiva says, not said in the past, says, Rashi interprets. The prophet Isaiah prophesies. For the Jew, ancient texts were not something that was abandoned on dusty shelves uh, or put in museums. They always surrounded him. And he talked and argued with them, defied them, and took joy in them. Through the use of Hebrew, they were always accessible. Today, too, Hebrew speakers are able to read the Bible, the Midrash, and the Mishnah text that, back, that, that date back 2,000 years or more. If we try harder, we can also become acquainted with the Talmud. And of course, the poetry of Spanish Jewry, the Jewish philosophy, biblical commentary, the mystic literature, the Zohar, the Hasidic and Enlightenment movement up through the literature of the rebirth of the modern Jewish uh, people and the modern day. If we want, if we speak Hebrew, if we want, we can learn about the lives of Jewish communities in North Africa, for example, in the 10th century of the Common Era, or in Renaissance Italy and more, through the system of question and answers, Shelot Chubot, should the response of, that connected Jewish world. I mentioned that these texts surrounded us, and it actually meant that they enveloped us as both individuals and as a people. This is a defensive wrapping that protected and preserved, preserved us in the many diasporas, in which even today is supposed to protect the Jews of the world so long as they are not in their natural home in Israel. So having this language, learning Hebrew, give you all these abilities. The text, Hebrew, the text, as important and moving as they are, provide a limited archaeological experience. Reading about and study about mm -hmm. Jerusalem, for example, in the first temple period, is not like walking around the city of David. When you're standing there, you understand what the poet meant in Psalms, the mountains surround Jerusalem, or dwells between his shoulders in Moses' blessing to Benjamin. What does it mean, between the shoulders? It means that the place where God resides, in Hebrew, Shochen, Shrina, is between the shoulders, geographically or topographically, halfway up, not in the valley, and not at the highest hilltop. That is how our forefather distinguished between their belief and the idol worship that was a quote on a top and lofty mountain and under every spreading tree. This is why the Temple Mount is not the highest mountain in Jerusalem, surrounded, as you can see here. About two weeks ago, only two weeks ago, archaeologists revealed how the decorated floor of the temple looked. You heard about it. They discovered it after intensive war 
that entailed putting together fragments of stone that had been found among the rubble removed from the Temple Mount. It supposedly just a floor, color, and stones, not very much. But the enormous excitement expressed in the news headlines about the discovery demonstrated that the archaeological find had touched a raw nerve. Every time we encounter a remnant of our past as a people, we get a response and perhaps an answer to the question of identity that we have been debating since we returned to history and unbearably so since we established an independent Jewish state. The question of who we are. Is the state of Israel a living continuation of the ancient kingdom of Israel? Are the Jews of the 21st century continuing the people whose high priest walked on those wonderful floor tiles? In the world of uh, literary researcher and critic, Baruch Kurzweil, are we a continuation or a revolution? You know, the Palestinian Authority is investing Herculean efforts in raising the Jewish history of the land of Israel and instilling in its place the history of the Palestinians. A lecturer, for example, lecturers, a lecturer in Birzeit University near Ramallah called our connection to the land of Israel a myth, a story that has no value, like the story of 1001 Arabian Nights. He added, after 60 years of excavations, they haven't found anything. Not a water jug, not a coin, not a pottery vessel, not a bronze weapon, not a piece of metal, nothing from that meat. Because it's a meat and a lie. These digs didn't leave a single yard excavated, but turned up nothing. The Palestinians routinely refer to the Jewish temple, they call it al mazum means the imagined. The imagined temple, what the, the Jews say that they, uh, it was on this place. And the stories of the Bible, they call it imaginary. Um, I refer you to the excellent watchdog site, Palestinian Media Awards, uh, which brings you many, many uh, 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 subjects translated to you from this uh, media. And lots of topics. The reason for the effort to deny our connection is clear. If there is no historic link between the Jewish people and this land, then we are talking about foreign invaders who took control of country that uh, wasn't theirs. But we, we don't live by what others say. Just as the Hebrew language is treated as something important, as I showed before, so is becoming acquainted with archaeological discoveries of our past Import, uh, uh, important to strengthening our identity as a people and our ties to the land of Israel. The iron wall that Zionist leaders and Jabotinsky sought to erect between us and our enemies so that they uh, would despair of ever driving us out is not just a literal iron wall of defense. First and foremost, it is an iron wall consciousness, of knowing our past. The vast majority of Israel Jews, the force Jews worldwide, are familiar to some extent with the archaeological finds from our past up to the time of Jerusalem, from the 10th century before Common Era, the kingdom of David and Solomon and onward. The city of David, the excavation. If you can finish, so. The city of David excavation, these past 25 years have helped deepen our knowledge. But everything having to do with the pre-monarchy period 
the crossing of the Jordan River and the arrival of the Israelite tribes at the end of the 13th century, the Far Kuman era, the settlement of the Jordan Valley and the expansion westward to the hills and stones past Shiloh is a black hole for most Jews. How many people here know what happened or things or, or visited in places in Israel that were that belong to the time before Jerusalem. How many people here know about sites that were before Jerusalem? I'm talking before 10th century, before Common Era. Only one? Okay, soon we will. So, okay. thank you. <coughs> so, uh, thank you, Doro. No, no, thank you. We have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Conclusion, <laughs> conclusion <laughs> remarks, yeah. You have to share the time with That's okay. Yeah, just a few conclusions and remarks. Yeah. 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 But the core of my... Are you the moderator? No, but I'm the... So I want to finish my... Okay, uh, excuse me. Let, let me talk, okay? Let me finish, okay? Please, yeah. That's fine. That works. That's okay. We have, we have another minute, no problem. So we will mark, listen, I was here, yeah. people here for me right. to walk half an hour. Yeah, I know. Okay, I have to finish sure, my, sure. Yeah, yeah. my, so I didn't sleep the whole night to prepare my, I respect the audience, let me finish the words. I came from Israel to give you a survey that I, I, I have done for the last, years, correct? It's not one day from. Soon we will mark a year since the death of Professor Adam Zertal, one of the greatest biblical archaeologists of the 20th century. The Israel Young Weekend Supplement was privileged to publish some of his great discoveries about the Gilgal, Gilgali, places named in the Bible where the Israelite tribes camped and worship God after crossing the Jordan River, long before Jerusalem and Shiloh existed. Zertal found six foot shaped enclosures that continue that contain similar characteristic and share of pottery from the Israelite period. Look all of them I like foot shape in the Jordan Valley five and also one see and you see one in uh, in the Judea <coughs> this is a, a an enigma what was this and uh, Zertal deciphered this was the Gilgalim the place of worship and and, uh, and gathering and crowning the kings etc etc <coughs> I have no time to elaborate on it if you want can have my uh, uh, details. On Mount Ebal, near, near Shechem, he found, he was privileged to find the holy grail of biblical archaeologists, an Israelite sacrifice altar that dated back to the 12th century before Common Era, and fit, <coughs> amazingly, the description of the altar on the same mountain found in the book of Joshua. See? <coughs> this is the description. And you can find it also if you if you Google it. My name is Ratal to wrote about it. During 35 years of the archaeological survey of Samaria, the Ratal and his team found some 1,500 sites, about 90% of which were previously unknown. Some 450 of them dated to Iron Age 1, or the time when the tribes of Israel were settling the land and the time of the first temple. These changes, this, all this exploration changed, changed everything that science knew about the Bible and our history. Israeli students and Jews all over the world need to know about this. This is the, the, the definitive part of our insurance uh, policy. 
I want to conclude. When I stood there, once of my uh, journey, when I stood there in the uh, Mount Ebal, there, and saw the altar of, uh, <coughs> of Joshua, what seemed to be the altar of Joshua, I, uh, <coughs> watching the ancient landscape, we saw uh, during the whole visit there, <coughs> a patrol of F-16 and F-15 fighter jets flew overhead the entire time. So the symbolism was very hard. A flyover of homage from the modern Hebrew military to this ancient Hebrew general, Joshua Salfnun, who probably built that altar and uh, conducted there the seminal ceremony that established us as a nation upon this good land. Thank you, Dr. Leidau. We'll go to our second speaker. We'll have questions later if we have time. Filippo uh, Sulin here. Uh, he's a great ambassador for Israel in the media. Philippe is a lawyer and a PhD candidate in international relations and political science at UCLA. He's an expert in science of influence and political communication and director of communication research and analytics at the Israel Project. He regularly appears in the media as a foreign affairs analyst and gives Israel's point of view. Today's topic will be why is anti-Israel propaganda works, why we have been failing, and how to use cutting edge psychology to win. Also, he will talk about the science of influence, how to uh, captivatingly tell Israel's story to millennials. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So thank you for having me. I just want to frame the conversation quickly with a question. Who's in a serious relationship here? <laughs> who lives with somebody? Who's had an argument about the dishes and who does the dishes? <laughs> who thinks that argument is actually about the dishes? <laughs> you? you need to listen. <laughs> and not just that, who thinks you can reason your way out of the problem of the dishes? <laughs> who thinks you can argue your way into somebody's heart? You sit down at a date and say, look, my grandparents lived a long time. I have these prospects of making money. I'm fairly neat. I have a high sperm count, and you should date me. <laughs> no one. And if the person responds by getting a restraining order on you, do you say, this person hates me unfairly? I'm being persecuted? Of course not. It's crazy to try to argue somebody into your yourself into their heart by argument. But that's exactly what we're doing as Jews with Israel. I'm gonna have to argue with this clicker tour. Okay. <laughs> we blame anti-Semitism when our arguments and our nasal whining doesn't get us what we want. To get a date, to get somebody to love you, to get to that place of infatuation, you have to generate in that other person a feeling that you're similar to them and they have to feel good in your presence when they think of you. And lest you think anti-Semitism is an insurmountable obstacle, think of this, this is Jonestown. A thousand people killed themselves and their own children because of communication. I, 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 I submit to you that that's stronger than anti-Semitism, the will to survive. Homosexual rights are the yardstick by which we judge foreign governments. 20 years ago, a lot of the homosexual activity was illegal here in Canada. I would say to you that the aversion to homosexuality in most <coughs> men back then was stronger than anti-Semitism. Revolution by smart communication. And you have people lining up for phones that cost $800 that work exactly like the last phone when they can buy them online. This is not because of some rational assessment of the technology. This is because the companies that work make people feel something about themselves. So we need to stop thinking about what's right and you start thinking about what's appealing, okay? People write their beliefs not on the basis of proof, but on the basis of what they find attractive. This is a revolution in thinking for Jews who have been seeped in Talmud for far too long. I put the example of Che Guevara because people put him off as a symbol of social justice, <coughs> whereas he was a racist, violent, tyrannical kind of man. But he looks pretty. And so everybody's been wearing a t-shirt while they're promoting communism, no offense to communists. 
<laughs> so let's forget about Hasbara, okay? I usually make people talk in your voice. Let's forget about Hasbara, the idea of explaining, the idea that we're in a court and we're going to litigate our way to people's good favor, as if there's a judge, as if the Cossacks are there and going to render a verdict. Look, we're nice, we treated them well. Look, in 1948, this and that, in 1740, forget about it. We're not talking about advocacy or litigation. We're not even talking about public diplomacy, which usually has a specific goal. It's not even marketing, because we're not getting a product, but you're getting close. It's about, the best word I can find is seduction, because I'm Moroccan, and I like that word. It's about appealing to people, OK? Now, how do you appeal to people? You have to focus on them, on their emotions. You can go into it to much detail. I study evolutionary psychology and emotions, a very powerful software that determines what we get attached to, how we think, what we remember. Emotions tell us if everything's okay. And that has got to be the payoff. Every big brand tells you a story about yourself. You're not buying or participating in any of these because it's a quality product that you sit, sat down and looked at the details for. Nobody's ever looked at the back. We need to do the same thing. Same thing with movies, right? All these iconic things that we remember, that we value, that we get attached to, provide us with a certain emotional balance. Either they uplift us, or they take us out of some form of anxiety. Focusing on the audience, as a consumer. They have no reason to care about us, they have no reason to listen to our story, and they certainly have no reason to go learn their history, and they won't. I taught at UCLA, the opportunity conflict, honor. The students did not look at the facts. Okay, go for it. What are the facts, what we want to say, and how we want to talk about anti-Semitism, and how we center the world, forget that, very hard. Move to, what does the audience need to feel? Who's the audience? No offense, these silly hipsters are our audience, okay? And they have a particular set of emotional needs. We all have similar needs, but they in particular are a generation that is subject to a lot of narcissism, a lot of anxiety, a lot of different things. Uh, attention spans are changing. They're not even having sex anymore, which I find is, you know, okay, yo, game over for Western society as far as I'm concerned. But. <laughs> They have all these specific needs that they're expressing all the time. They need to feel safe. They're asking for safe spaces. All day in the town, they're asking to feel safe, and we're coming and they're saying, you're an anti-Semite. In 1948, the Arabs attacked first. Who cares? This person is afraid of counter opinions. What does feeling safe mean? For everybody, but especially for young mammals, young humans. A sense of belonging and a sense of self-worth, OK? Self-definition and affirmation. I want to be part of something, or I want to feel good about who I am. I'm starting to be an adult, and I have to confront the bigger world. It's also why we're losing Jews. All these groups that go on camp say, no, it's social justice, and tikkun olam, and fight crime, and everything, and actually Moses was a Palestinian. It's just because they want to fit in. I don't have time to go into it, but it's because they want to fit in. If we make it safe and cool for them to fit in, if they feel they're going to be loved by being Jewish on campus, then it's cool, and part of something cool, a lot of this will go away. Now, that the what was the emotion. How to make people feel good about themselves. The how is very important. Simple, automatic, visual. Attention spans now are an average of eight seconds. That means you stopped listening to me a very long time ago. <laughs> OK? Because people are hammered with different information and a lot of different things coming at them, all at 20, and into anxiety, and who gets to pee in what bathroom, and what's going on, OK? I don't know if you've followed the debate about identity politics and who to be where. I just want to say when I was 21, 22, when we talked about bathroom college, it was where to get high, and where to get late, and how to get caught. Today, things are a lot more complicated. Than <laughs> you do things visually. You're all feeling a bit randy now because of George, right? The visuals pass by part of the brain that you cannot resist. There's no critical interaction. It has an immediate emotional response. Every communication should have a very strong visual aspect. Because you see people holding hands, you see people hugging, you feel a fraction of that emotion. You can make people live something you want them to live, as opposed to argument. Analogies. Use what people know. What we know is home. What we know is how we make sense of the world. What we know feels safe. Use what people know to build on that. The greatest speakers in history use analogies. I'm okay, a great example. Instead of arguing about the Constitution, he said, we are exiting Egypt, essentially. We are the exodus, right? The promise line. And then you go to a place that people need to believe and need to feel. For example, this is a very bad example of truth because it's a room of Jews. This is a shotgun. Okay? This is to 
tell you secrets can kill you. Right? Instead of making a long argument. We're burning great forests, we're burning our own lungs of the planet. Straight the power of knowledge. Good communication, good as barak, good pro Israel messaging should be like music. You don't have to think about it. It happens, you absorb it, and you feel something good. You don't have to sit there analyzing the notes. That's how you should communicate. Make people feel good. Examples, pictures that we inject the whole story into automatically change the world. This one picture after four years of the Civil War being ignored in Syria may unravel Europe. This one changed public opinion about the Vietnam War in America. One picture because we throw in a, a, a whole story that we have packed in our brain. This one fueled the second intifada, the terrorism. You know what's true, nobody cares. The Palestinians do this with perfection. They use compassion triggers. Compassion is a very strong evolutionary emotion. Compassion changes how we make moral judgments. Compassion becomes addictive, and it makes us feel good to feel sorry for people. So they use children in general, like their logos. They use easy, immediate narratives that are romantic. They make it cool. I want to know this person. No words, no this. And then they use what everybody knows. For every group they want an alliance with, they go and they say, whatever you're suffering, whatever need of solidarity you feel, I'm the same. They don't reinvent the real, they don't reinvent anything. In fact, they took our history also in the narrative. Okay, so the South, uh, South Africans, they're suffering apartheid. In Ireland, they're doing the trouble, the same thing. The Jews, the Holocaust. Ferguson is Palestine, Palestine is Ferguson. The revolution in American pol uh, identity politics, at least, three words. One similarity, cops and people riding. The Mexicans are the same people jumping the fence. I saw master's students at UCLA become fervent BDS supporters because of this one equivalent. People who know a lot of stuff were told, we're the same as you, that's it, I'm on your side. People need to feel this. With Native Americans, they do, if you do this at a Halloween party, you get killed. And this is recent to the North Dakota pipeline. They're everybody's victims to everybody. We're the same as you, okay? People feel solidarity, they need to feel it, and it's immediate, and it's emotional, and it sticks. The result, when I see them, I see us, or LOS. All of these narratives tap into work together, immediately, like a flash. And then you have people all around the world citing the Palestinian cause as part of how they define themselves, as part of how they find romance in their lives, as part of how they try to give a purpose to their life. Same thing, self-definition, like we said, and purpose. What do we do? Assume everybody's a moral philosopher and giving them papers. This is an actual paper. I'm sorry, but what I'm going to say in font fucking eight points. This is what we're giving. I think the F word was necessary here. Eight points will turn me anti-Israel. Okay? And if you can read, because you have to go like this and read, what is an apartheid? You can hear the money, you can hear the allergies. <laughs> <laughs> the problem, Israelis are seen as soldiers, religious, militarily unpleasant. This is what happens when you look at Google Maps for Israeli. This changes everything about people evaluating things. Instead of seeing that they're like us, people see Israelis out there that this is the weird thing I don't want to associate with. This is what we need to change, first and foremost. Who we are. By using the mechanism that I said, if you compare it to Brazil, and I couldn't even put the first page because of the movies, <laughs> Brazil has a ton of social justice problems. Ton. It doesn't want to cancel this on social justice. But when we think of it, we think of parties and dancing and samba and soccer and movies. <laughs> What's our one word story that makes people feel a sense of romance and purpose? Gone since the 1950s, Exodus. We don't have a story. And if I ask people here, I hear 50 stories, I usually do. We need a one word story. They have victimhood, what's our? And then, let's make it visually cool and attractive. Let's make, make people actually want to be part of something. Don't show them a religious person at the hotel, who by definition is different from them. Make them us, and us they want to know, to idealize. Okay? Tel Aviv's badass for anybody who hasn't been there recently. It has the culture that is a utopia for young people. We're hiding it. And put pictures in whatever you say, or words, that tell an immediate story that people can inject all kinds of political arguments in. Friday night television. Associate Israel with family. 
innocent memories, childhood, love. This is who we're supposed to be ornamenting. Everybody wants this. We provide it, nobody knows. I can't go into the details of this picture, but people need to see us in them in an idealized romantic way. And you know what the big advantage is? For us, it's the truth. Thank God. This is actually who we are. This is why I'm here. If you look at what they're doing on this tower of this picture. <laughs> Innocence, playfulness. This is my very good friend and mentor, David Fisa, who tried to put a campaign about this. If somebody's innocent and playful, they're not guilty of apartheid. And this gets ingrained in your mind like a tattoo. Okay? With all that's going on in Europe with women, Israel's a place where women can sit in the street, drink alcohol, smoke cigarettes, complain about their husbands or something, she's not happy, <laughs> and maybe talk about me, and, and be safe and empowered. Okay? This is our narrative, I suggest. Overcoming. No matter what. And we can do it for our enemies as well. I need to argue anti Semitism, they did this in the 1930s, and that. People stop listening. Put pictures, make it quick, use what people know, make it appealing and colorful. And I guarantee you a lot of effect for a lot of reasons. Alright? I hope I didn't go over time by too much. Um, I hope I'll have time for a question later. And I hope I didn't go over time. Thank you, Philippe. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Edith Harrell. Uh, she's the founder and CEO of Global Loria. Dr. Edith Harrell is an accomplished tech entrepreneur, an Israeli-American entrepreneur who strongly believes in the mission of the IEC. Edith is the founder and CEO of Globaloria.com, which is a leading provider of computer science education in the Americas public schools. She's an award-winning author and a futuristic thought leader on the intersection between education theory, economic development, and technology innovation, and is a renowned innovator in the ed tech industry. Edith has been advancing STEM and computing, educa computing education for decades by transforming education systems worldwide for better, to better prepare today's youth for the global knowledge innovation economy. She was born and raised in Israel by two teachers. She's a high school champion athlete and was a gymnast on Israel's national modern gymnastic team. She holds four degrees from Tel Aviv University, Harvard, Stanford, and MIT. She, hold, she will talk today about the future of education. Wow, <laughs> thank you. <Yeah. laughs> I'm so happy to be here, and thank you, Sefi, for this lovely introduction. Uh, if you will not have time for questions now, tweet your questions to me, I promise to respond. It's at ed, -E -D -E -D, or ed at .com. And if you can kindly take a picture of us, then I will also tweet about this panel, because really incredible talks so far. So I am an Israeli ent uh, education entrepreneur, Israeli-American. I think this is IHC, and I probably represent the group that drives this movement, which is IAE which is Israeli-American entrepreneurs. There are a lot of amazing entrepreneurs. Uh, many of us came to study here and stayed to really start our companies and, and do amazing work here in the United States. And I think when I'm walking around and researching this, many of us dream to one day come to Israel and do it there too. And I hope that through this connection and communication, we'll find partners both in America and in, in everywhere in the world, because many of us think globally with technology as well as Israel. So this is very, very fun. Uh, I like to celebrate my roots and identities as I was raised in a startup. I was, Israel was 10 when I was born, and I grew up in the 60s and 70s in a startup, which I think created this entrepreneur spirit in me. And my, my parents, my family, surviving families, were educators. My father started the first high school uh, for high school dropout in Israel. And um, this is all blended in my roots, including, of course, the education that I got that made me also an American, an American academic and then an American entrepreneur. Um, and it's exciting for me to talk today about the future of education. Uh, I think the picture of the two women sitting there, uh, Philippe, if you don't mind, there are probably two women tech CEOs in Israel complaining that nobody wants to fund them. So I don't think they're angry about their husband. I think Personal trauma. Maybe they only got a degree from MIT or Stanford, and they cannot be funded in Israel because it's a 
boys' network. And if they are from the periphery, they are even angrier because nobody provided them in high school the opportunity, the education. And if they are Arab Israelis, if one of them is an Arab Israeli, actually one looked like one, uh, they are even more frustrated because one million of them did not get the education like people in Tel Aviv in this beautiful beach uh, that we saw. So there are a lot of things I saw in these pictures that I think needs to be corrected and I would love to talk to you about. That was the whole point about ejecting what we yes, think are. I'm ejecting a lot of other pictures, but also it's the <laughs> captions that you put for the pictures that matter to you. And I think it's that word that you pick to describe your image that you tweet is also important. But that's, that's for afterwards. I like to be provocative here. Um, I worked very hard over the years to actually create imagery and to create manifestations and models for what I think the future of education should be so everybody from all diverse backgrounds, men and women, from uh, you know, better socioeconomic status or less, can actually benefit and contribute to the future. Uh, as a, I'm in the intersection of computer science, cognitive science, and learning science, and I'm always with a goal to engage kids today in what I believe education should be in the future. My research project, especially with Seymour Packard, who is very well known for starting the whole field of education technology, who just passed away in July, my mentor, my teacher, my colleague, and my company that we started together, Mama Media, the World Wide Workshop, and now Global Gloria, are all manifestations of what I think we can do today already to really express what the future needs. So Global Gloria, we are solving three critical problems. One, that on a societal level, there are many, many millions, here in the United States, but all over the world, in Israel too, there are many unfilled STEM jobs and computing jobs. And there are not enough equal opportunities for everybody to be educated from a, a young age to really be able to get this job. So we need to do it. It's, it's urgent. It's like a human right. We have to fulfill. Everybody should be liberate. Everybody should be educated for a pathway for prosperity and self-expression. As a result, in the United States, we have 5.5 million students, 132,000 schools, 132,000 principals are walking around in a panic because they don't have enough teachers. There are 4 million teachers in the United States, and they're not prepared to teach. Right? They're not prepared to equally provide this education that I'm going to talk about. So principals are in a panic and they're willing to pay for materials, for training, that to, to really satisfy that need. Uh, and there is a huge need to really work with principals and superintendents and train them too. And the materials that are there right now, these thick textbooks that students really think are boring and they're boring, and all these technical tutorials and apps that are there are not really designed with standards for schools, for course credit and grade, and really structured in a way that communicates the principals, the teachers, the students, the parents, everybody in that ecosystem. So everything is wrong, and these are the three problems that we're trying to solve in Global Orca. But let me, let me share what, one story about me. Um, it's something about me and my education philosophy, is that I love big questions. Let me tell you why. My father, who cared so deeply about education and thought that's the thing that can solve every single problem in Israel and the world, he used to come every day from school, from his school as a principal, and he used to ask me, Edith, do you have a good question for me today? And then he will clarify, not just a question, like a really big question. Just think. And let's talk about your question. So this is what all you need to know about me, <laughs> pretty much, and about my philosophy. It started at age three with questions like this from my father. And I learned that questions are indeed important because they lead to new epistemology, to explorations, and to new knowledge. And he pushed me to really see what is, what, what does tomorrow mean? Because if you ask a question, you really need to think about something that doesn't exist or is not yet explained or a problem that is not yet solved. So what does tomorrow mean? What does tomorrow mean? <coughs> this is my answer, and think about yours. Tomorrow needs a fully computer literate generation who can ask big questions and then delve into research and think about systems and be creative about using computational technology for inventing and constructing human solutions. What tomorrow needs is innovative minds of different kinds, lots of different kinds of minds that are driven by human, humanism and love. 
not by technocentrism. So yes, technology plays an important role, but I'm not advocating for technology-centric society. What more needs is epistemological pluralism. Epistemology is how we move from not knowing to knowing. And tomorrow really needs this pluralism in epistemology. That is the understanding that diverse minds and diverse teams with diverse minds can actually ask more bigger questions that and come up with multidimensional solutions that can satisfy everybody. We cannot have men design technology for everybody, men and women, boys and girls, who really come from so many different backgrounds. What tomorrow needs is kids who can fall in love with learning, not kids that sit and listen to information being instructed and solve multiple choice questions and tests and really do tutorials, right? With like head phones and computers. That's not the image. What tomorrow needs is kids who can construct and build and simulate and invent and drive their own learning and their own education in their own pace. So what we're calling is not for improving instructionism with technology, but rather improving, facilitating constructionism and really moving towards what I call the constructionist economy. Because that's where we are and that's what tomorrow needs. People who can really construct in field and work in teams and that's when you need to see. At the highest level of focus for my work, I believe that computer science for all, which is a big movement that I help Initiate. It's a big movement that the White House is driving, and my friend Megan Smith, who is the United States CTO. It's my vision that education of the future is really about computer science for all as a human right for justice. And let's play the video yep. that I want to quickly show you, and then I'll go through. And as you think about that, when you watch the video, think about what's your idea about what the new literacy is all about. It's the one on the right. And you can put the whole screen. A lot of the world's problems today really need people to collaborate together and try to solve the most pressing problems with technology. Coding is new literacy, coding is new writing. <laughs> and we need to start with this literacy from a very, very young age. in the first of its kind for project-based learning of computer science, game design, and coding. The students there registered to a course where every day they work for an hour, an hour and a half designing games. And we teach them how to come up with an idea, do research, create a design document, prototype their game. They are on a network. It's like the Facebook for social construction of knowledge. Every step of the way, they document what they're working on, how they're working on it, and where they are in the process, so they can receive feedback from the teachers and the peers in the classroom. They learn through design, but they also explain something through their games and through their design. There is nothing more helpful than learning by teaching, but learning by explaining. Well, Global Art is uh, teaching our students. They are excited, students are processing, they learn finding. You want kids to have their how to be critical thinkers, and how to be patient. And to do the research on the topic, they actually have to be proficient with the topic before they can start attending the game. Before I got to school board yet, I didn't even you know how to use a computer, and now I'm learning coding. I use it in making a Spanish game, which all forces me to be able to think about how to teach others. My game was brought up by Nisa, who was a boy in Apocalypse, and he would have to collect enough questions to make the barrier that's around the exit disappear. It makes me feel very good and really proud of myself. It makes me feel powerful for the stories and that I'm the people making the game. I decide what I can teach. It's a career I want to pursue. This is what I believe I can do, and this is what I want to do for my future. Great. Um, How's that? Great. So here's another big question. What is literacy today? And what is the mission of literacy? We can problems today really need people to collaborate together. No one to enter this again. Okay, good. Um, it's all about Google.com. We have many other imagery videos and, and visualizations to help you vet, you know imagine that future. So the United States used to call literacy the three R's. Are you familiar with the three R's? Reading, writing, and arithmetic. Right? 
And I think that the world has changed so dramatically that we're moving towards something else, which I mean the three axes. It's our ability to be literate in exploring digital spaces with digital tools, expressing ourselves with digital media, with new tools, and then exchanging, right? Knowledge, simulations, data visualizations with each other, both in physical spaces as well as mobile spaces. So it's the exploration, expression, and exchange. These are the three axes. And probably what we need to do these days is to master the three arts through the three exits because the young generation will not be able to engage in the three arts unless they can do it through the three exits. So it's really turning what literacy is on its head. So what tomorrow needs, as a summary, is a generation of children who love to learn, especially the computational tools and programmable spaces and be totally fluent, just like they do reading and writing. I strongly believe that what tomorrow needs is also from all of us to understand how to fall in love with learning, starting young. Because at the end, it's our ability to learn and learning how to learn that drives everything in the constructionist economy. Tomorrow needs a generation of kids who know how to solve big problems, ask big questions, building applications, prototypes, design, simulation, data representations, virtual worlds, and global systems. So, What's in the way? I think there are three things in the way. First is that people school apply this computational literacy and put it like in an after school once a week, or maybe in some club, or like an elective. And so A, it doesn't really serve everybody. It's a selective tiny little group, usually boys. And two, it really is not enough. You really have to do it every day. You can, can imagine you had a pencil lab in a school and you just go there once a week to use the pencil, we need to learn how to write. Now, and you had the pencil club for like 40 kids in a school that has 3,000 kids, like the one, like the one schools, the, the school that I'm working with in Texas. Big, huge school, three, 5,000 kids in a high school. A pencil lab for 40 students once a week. Will they learn how to write? What about the rest of the kids, right? Another really important um, thing that is in the way is what I call pop computing. So there are a lot of apps out there. And things that kind of, I think, I say, oh, yes, we need computer science. Let's use whatever, Code Academy, Khan Academy, some tutorials and things. But what happens is that there is a lot of drag and drop in a lot of apps that are not really the mindset of an engineer or computer scientist. It's not about the knowledge. So, so imagine you're using Guitar Hero. And you're really, really good with Guitar Hero. And you really love it. You honestly have some overlap. And you learn a lot about music and music theory and playing the guitar. But will I hire you for the Philharmonic? Will I accept you to a music school in a community college or an undergrad? Probably not. If you thought here is the only thing on your resume, that, that it's not going to make it. So we need to make sure that they learn to program with computational tools that are industry standard, with JavaScript and Unity and ActionScript and HTML5 and CSS, that they know design thinking, that they know how to work in teams, that they do the real deal that the industry needs. It cannot be just driving more apps once a week. Right? So pop, commu pop computing is really in the way. And the last thing is that there is a myth about the digital natives. Oh, today's generation are all digital and the problem is the teachers. No, that is a myth. I'm working in a space, K-12, 55 million students, probably 50 million of them are not, unfortunately, digital natives. They don't have access to bedrooms at home. They don't do tutorials and kind of have in their bedroom. They have parents that work two jobs that don't even have uh, the money to, to do these things at home. And they have to do it in school because they may use games and they may uh, be able to do the drug and drug of computing, but they don't know even browsers and tasks and HTML and CSS and JavaScript and how to build things. And we all learn how to write, but we don't all become journalists. We don't all become journalists, we don't all become writers, we don't all become communications experts and fiction writers. But we all learn how to write because that makes us better readers and the more we read, the better we write. Same thing with games and with apps. We all play them, but we are illiterate until we know how to write them. Okay. And this is something that we need to remember when we think when we think about literacy. Okay. And my teacher, Simon Pepper, used to say all the time, already 30 years ago, computers cannot produce good learning. Computers cannot produce literacy. But learners, humans, can drive and produce 
good learning with computers that can make them bigger. Thank and you. if learning is done with passion and engagement, it will be oh. a much better place. Well, thank you, Edith. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Jake Schwartz. He's the CEO and co-founder of General Assembly. He has a BA from Yale University, MBA with honors from the Wharton School. His company, General Assembly, is a global education company specializing in the most in-demand skills across data, design, tech, and business. It was called the number one most innovating company in education. <coughs> Mr. Schwartz was named ENY Entrepreneur of the Year in 2014. General Assembly has 25 campuses around the world and has worked with more than 350,000 individuals and 4,000 companies, including 20% 20 of the Fortune 500. General Assembly's focus on affordable and accessible education, combined with education for an employment approach in helping to create a diverse talent pipeline. His topic today is the future of education and talent. Hello, hi, great to be here today. Um, I'm gonna start with a personal story, which is, I grew up um, in Oregon, I grew up on a farm until I was about seven. And went through high school and ended up getting to go to Yale University. And coming from the boonies where I was, I felt like I had made it. Like I was set for life, I was a member of a club that was going to take care of me for the rest of my life. And even when I got my diploma, it was written all in Latin on this beautiful paper, really heavy weight. Um, and this Latin phrases that, that basically almost made me feel like it was like a Harry Potter spell. It was this magic thing that was going to open any door that I wanted to, uh, to open for. And then I got out into the real world. And, um, and sort of instead of the bucolic green and gothic buildings of, of, of the campus, I found this sort of vast desert that is really reality. Um, and what I found, and I think what many people find, is, is, is that you know college is amazing, but it does not really give people practical skills. Um, it doesn't necessarily give them um, active access to pathways in their career. And they end up having to do their own path building to get to the next. Sometimes that's apprenticing, sometimes that's leveraging family connections, sometimes that's going even more into debt and spending more time and opportunity cost on graduate school to actually uh, prepare themselves for their professional And when I was in my 20s, I, I felt all of this and more. Um, I spent a lot of time wandering around, wondering what was wrong with me, what I should do better, um, feeling like I missed some magic on ramp school because I didn't want to be an investment banker or a consultant. Um, and, and I ended up uh, going back to business school. And you know, in that period of time in my 20s, I just kept thinking, wow, like this is the, the time of my life where I'm most willing to work hard, most open-minded, more seeing that structure that I that will, that will be my entire life. And there was such a limited pool of access. But I ended up having a feeling like the best thing to do for me was to push the reset button, go back to business school, take two years off, spend um, gobs of money, and and frankly, you know, spend maybe about 12 weeks learning and the rest of the time kind of thinking about that next step in my, in my career. And when I was at business school, I was thinking about this. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Two years um, really to learn the same basically five frameworks over and over and over again. Um, Lots of drinking, lots of partying, lots of great times with other people. But this is a very, very expensive vacation. How is this working? <laughs> and, and what I realized was is that, is that um, our, our higher education institutions have essentially become toll takers. They're middlemen between corporations that um, you know are, are interested in, in hiring but don't want to do very much work to identify that talent. And people like me who are sort of wandering in the desert of, of life, looking for that next honor to their career. And, uh, you know, I was thinking a lot about how, how lost and lonely I felt in that period of my 20s, and how vulnerable I was to that next step. 
And how what I really wanted is that feeling of being less lost in the world. And, and all of this experience is really what led, uh, led General Assembly to be what it is today. So General Assembly started in New York. We were a community for entrepreneurs. Uh, and we started offering small classes just at night. Uh, whenever we could get somebody to teach, it was very ad hoc. And what we saw was this incredible demand, night after night, uh, people in their 20s and 30s, and even you know, beyond that, were coming to our small little campus in New York to take whatever classes they could get. So hungry to learn, so hungry for practical skills, not taught by academics, sorry. Uh, but uh, no, no but the people who actually have the, that practical experience in the field. And I saw that, that there's basically this entire gap, vocational training, is seen as, in, as a, a lower form of education. It was something that, was, that has been treated as the bottom of the heap for people who could not uh, make their way to all the more lofty forms of liberal arts. And, and what we, we had left, were left with was a system of ad hoc apprenticeship and vocational on-the-job training, um, and a complete lack of actual skills-based training for people um, who were really eager to get to that next and so what we did was turn these one-night classes at the General Assembly into full like, three-month programs designed to help people get to that next stage um, in their job and career. We teach web development, product management, data science, digital marketing. Um, and most importantly, connect them directly with a network of employers that helps them get to that next stage. Now, I think really inherent in this is, is the key concept, which is that in the world of education right now, there's an entire sort of school of thought that higher education is going to be entirely online. Online is the way to solve the sort of crisis in education. Uh, too much cost, not enough benefit. Um, the secret of that cost and benefit, that return on investment equation, is that it's so inefficient right now. It has gotten inflated way out of proportion over the last 30 years. Uh, the cost of education have actually been inflated and the cost of increasing cost has actually gone up more than healthcare in the United States. It's pretty remarkable, actually. Um, and um, really, you don't necessarily need to, to reduce costs to improve that return on investment equation. You need to increase returns. And that's really the focus of general effective. So what did we, what did we do? We ended up uh, building the three-month programs. We now run them offline, which was almost very novel in the, in the very forward-leaning tech, tech world that we were in. Uh, we now have 25 campuses around the world where these classes are running um, every week around all of these different disciplines. We're launching new disciplines all the time. This last year, uh, 2016, we will have educated 20,000 students in just the three-month programs, not to mention all of our enterprise programs and one-night and weekend workshops. Uh, next year, that number should be close to 40,000. Um, and most importantly, in this process, we are building a brand new sort of alumni network, um, one where everybody is in the most upwardly mobile part of their career, uh, focused on design, technology, uh, te development, and business, and data. And, um, and most importantly, we'll be ready for their next job, their jobs after that, um, right down the line. And we believe over time, we are going to build the most professional network, most powerful professional network. Now, why is this important? Why does this matter? Why is this other than a really nice entrepreneurial story? Well, I think that what, what, what our success shows is a massive mindset shift. That all of us in this room are really just focusing on our second thing. Because when we all grew up in a world where the highest attainments of a professional life, where the goals to make your way in the world, to be so upwardly social mobile, to be respected by your parents and your peers, was to get degrees. And what we are seeing is that equation, that currency of the degree, and I really think it is a currency, is starting to be treated less like a valuable gold bar and more like a fiat currency that has been inflated to the point where it is no longer nearly as valuable or valuable. And in that process, we both see a crisis where we are putting um, a massive portion of our GDP against these fiat currencies, 
We are training people through K through 12 to prepare to get these degrees, um, which then won't necessarily lead to the achievements that they think they will. And in that process, um, we, we can and we will be entering a crisis. Colleges will be going out of business. Um, you know, there will be a, a, there are more and more students every day who are questioning the value of college. And these are actually okay things, but we need to be ready and embrace them. And in that process will be ultimately, will be the need for alternatives. Will be the need to go back to first principles of why all of these educational institutions exist. The liberal arts is an amazing thing. Research institutions are amazing things. We are at the risk of losing those don't properly articulate their place and properly supplement them and, and look at the ways that they do not serve our society in the way that they claim to. And in that process will be a lot of financial pain, a lot of disruption. But on the other side of it, maybe a world where we can more rationally um, provide education to the people who need it and people who want it in ways that actually prepare them for the future that is. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Uh, our last and uh, not least, uh, Aliza Klein is our next speaker. She's the founding executive of One Table. Aliza is a dynamic leader and a social entrepreneur and a passionate promoter of design thinking. She serves as the founding executive director of One Table an online and in-person hub for millennials to end their week with intention and create unique Shabbat dinners. In its first two years, One Table has inspired and supported more than 2,500 dinners in 38 cities, engaging more than 25,000 young adults and creating close to 40,000 seats at the table. Aliza also co-founded Maim Chaim Community, Mikveh and Education Center in Boston, an international model for re-imaging Jewish ritual open to the full diversity of the Jewish community. She lives in Brooklyn, New York with her family. Uh, Aliza will talk today about designing the Shabbat for the 21st uh, century. Through a lens of curiosity, optimism, and design thinking, Aliza Klein will share how she and her partners created One Table, now inspiring and supporting tens of thousands of young adults across the country to reclaim Friday night as an opportunity for both social and sacred reconnection.
first organization that I founded was very much based on my own personal experience. Um, now I'm 44, I've three kids, I've been making Shabbat my whole life. I am not our target population. I'm not. I can't use my own experience the same way. So I am required to use empathy in a different way. And then in the in between the different organizations that I've been lucky enough to build, I found design making and learned this language. And it took me, who was a very intuitive leader, to give me a system that actually helps me think and solve problems in a new way. This is the very premise of it. What if we start with the person, not the thing? It's called human-centered design. Uh, and the company that coined this idea of the race of Silicon Valley, many of you may be already familiar, they came up with this cute little mouse thing that changed the way these computers. Um, and the whole concept was, what does the person need? Where's the pain? How do I design for that? Um, and this is just a very quick illustration. So forgive me if you've already like, been to the science school at Stanford, but very quickly. Um, let's call this the Irving Schiller Inn bookshelf, right? How many of you own this bookshelf? This is designed from which company? Yeah. IKEA, so clear, right? So IKEA has many um, slogging, slogging and stuff, and this we're calling Irving Schiller Inn. It's a storage unit for books and things. They come to IDEA and say, I'd like to design, redesign the Irving Schlergen bookshelf. I made it up, but you can use whatever you like. For children, small children. Okay, so if I'm going to redesign this bookshelf for young children, oh, well, maybe I'll make it green or yellow or orange, and I'll kind of make it down low, and I'll fix it to the wall, and maybe make it soft edges, and make it safe to play with, maybe I can crawl in, like all kinds of things. Like, how, how, how might a kid really enjoy it? Those are all perfectly valid decisions, except that all that, that was designed is like taking this and adapting it as opposed to designing for the children. So where are the children? The children, if they were here, again, I'm short to begin with, but like come all the way down here, they're generally under the furniture, right? My children spent a lot of time living underneath chairs and tables and finding little nooks to crawl in. So what's that perspective? So I want to design for the person on the thing, I have to go under the table. So the idea of design is literally go where to get changed their perspective. Where are they? And then they came up and they're saying, what are the kids? They came up with this funny looking thing, which does not look at all like a current token, right? And maybe it's a, like an upside down stool or squishy things or I don't know, whatever. But it turns out if you fix this under the table, now I'm going to get it on my stuff and I want to shut it up all by myself. It's a storage unit for kids, <laughs> which I would not have come to if I had started by just looking at the bookshelf, right? This, I would have designed what I thought was personally practical. So this whole thing provides, this is the design cycle. So everybody said this beautifully. This is like in 10 seconds. The first thing is empathizing. What's the point of view for the first time designing? Then I have to figure out what's the actual problem. So in this case, the kid is like, I got a stuff animal and I'm under the table. I'm not going to go under the table to go to this bookshelf over there. I want it right here. That's my problem. Then I can come up with, oh, there's an idea. I need good ideas. Put them on the thing. Anything. Anything goes. Then prototype. I actually have to see if it works. Build something and then test it out. And if the kids hate it, then guess what? I gotta go back to it. So it, it doesn't look like it's like what it is. Okay, so now let's go back to shops. Right and I go. It's what it looks like. This is my original, right? I need to think about this, but for a different population. We already talked about what happens if I design for this. I can come up with a really beautiful box or something. By the way, I'll add CD and nice music. Like, you can come up with your own things. Oh, it would just be quivered like that. Great. But it still kind of looks like a modified original. Where are my target population? Right? Because it has had all kinds of very uh, funky images as well. This is an image of millennials in their natural habitat, right? <laughs> There is this, this is a beautiful rooftop in Los Angeles uh, where we held like a focus group, basically, this is a focus group, um, and try to understand what's going on. To understand, well, what does Friday night mean to you? What does hosting mean to you? What does hospitality mean? Because I mean, you choose the restaurant, and we all come. 
but basically using technology to help us help people be together in their life. After doing those thousand prototypes, we ultimately created our own platform, which looks a little bit more like this. Um, and I encourage you to play with it if you like. But now we have a totally different perspective. So we ended up with this. We now, this last Friday night, there were, I believe, 97 dinners across the country, which was about 1,500 seats at the table. We're now averaging at least 1,000 a week, which is wonderful. It means we have to raise a heck of a lot more money because I've actually run out. Our supply is not big enough for demand, which is an unusual problem in the nonprofit world and in the Jewish community. Uh, and when people say, oh, this is so simple, right? So Shabbat, I do think, is pretty fundamental and simple. Meets the need that we have for the brings sanctity and health and balance into our lives, which we need. The data also shows that millennials are more uh, disconnected and lonely than any other generation. And I can help solve that through the ritual of Shabbat and Shabbat dinner and focusing on the connection by creating this. Um, so this is, what if we start with a person and not Shabbat? Then we come up with a completely different opportunity. These were just some of the stats you heard before. But we are constantly looking at what's going on where are people? What guests are becoming close? Are they moving? What is from one city to another? How do you find that sense of belonging that we mention to the need that we have? And respond to it again in a Jewish answer, a Jewish community response. And it's not exclusive to the people, so I can invite anybody to see what's going on. Thank you, Alisa. Now I'll we'll let you uh, ask questions to any of the uh, panel presenters. Anybody has a question to anybody? Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Nicole. Uh, question to uh, Phil. Uh, so you say you don't get it into the dirt of talking about the history, and then we did this class in 48, and we did that. Uh, but when, you're, when there's all these accusations, you, you say don't even bother countering them, only counter, if you're a president of form, uh, not countering an accusation uh, is almost a mission. Um, okay, so there's a lot there. First of all, you gotta know what the context is and who your audience is. What I'm talking about is mass campaign, first introduction, how, you, how we need to think about telling our story, okay? Now, I think if you answer accusations, you just strengthen them. Because the mind works with associations. It doesn't work with evidence. So if I sit here and I say 15 times, I'm not a child molester, which I won't, and even that I shouldn't have done. You're going to associate me with that accusation. So no, even though I do it on Facebook, that's just sport. Um, I would make a campaign of humanizing us and telling, and telling who we are. And if I can kind of confirm what Elisa was saying, not that I could presume to confirm, I have a very good friend who's Brazilian who was at SIPA. SIPA is the School of International Studies at Columbia University. It is a, a manufacturing, a manufacturer of anti-Israel people. And she came out, you know, hipster, bicycle riding, tight jeans, I hate Israel. And we had her over for Shabbat, and my Shabbats are kind of alternative at home. They were more before, you know, when I, before I had kids also. And we just had fun, and she just hung out, we drank, whatever, and, and you know, we had we, we good dinner and just became friends. And that, that alone changed her entire perspective on Israel and how she approached all the accusations. Now she's pro Israel, she's in Brazil, and she's calling me, Filippi, they're doing this, I don't know what to do. And, and so, so she's like an ally now, right? And it's kind of cool that we have an ally with that accent. You're welcome. Um, <coughs> so my point is, you need to humanize and think how you would relate to an accusation about somebody in your own life. The brain doesn't change when you change context. Same brain. Somebody says that person's an asshole. If you've had an interaction with that person and you've had a meaningful relationship or a positive ex exposure to that person, you've, your reaction to the accusation is going to be very, very different. So no, the first thing we should do is not debate. It's very hard for us Jews, but yeah, ignore a lot of the accusations and strengthen the positive thing we have going for us and define the other side in a negative way, separately, also. It's important how they are defined. We've left the field open completely for them to define themselves as the real Israelites, as part of, you know, talking about archaeology. So that, that's what I have to say. And by the way, just. To the picture thing, you saw CEOs, I hung out on that corner, it was with my friends and they were talking negatively about, you know, whatever people's in lives. The whole point was people inject what they want to inject in pictures and we have to be very conscious of that when we tell a story. Absolutely, <coughs> Any other questions? My question is, how receptive are 
Well, so the funny thing is, is the players at the same time are complaining endlessly that they're not getting the talent that they need, that they can't find the right talent, um, and that they leave tons of jobs unfilled, which actually costs them revenue and business. Um, and I think one of the ways that can be sort of that's shown with what we do is that you know our placement rate for our full time you know, career transformation programs is ninety nine percent within one hundred and eighty days. Um, you know, people are working in the field. Um, now, I think that employers can do a lot more, and I think one of the sort of the the funny things about the way we've set up our sort of workforce development programs in the United States is um, employers sort of wait for government and educational institutions that sort of there's a weird you know uh, cluster of that. They wait for them to provide them with what they say they need, and, that, and their view is that businesses should just be able to say what they need, and, and government and education providers should be able to produce that for them. And, That's true. And, and that government, and then government really sits, sits there and foots the bill through these you know, massive, massive subsidized debt programs uh, that they deploy um, in order to sort of you know, make it affordable for people who literally do not have the credit or the cash to be able to um, pay for educational programs on their own. Um, my real vision for the future is I believe that um, employers need to spend a lot more of their own money, their own time, have more skin in the game in training and development and, and sourcing. Um, the irony is, is that you know, U.S. corporations spend about $190 plus billion dollars on um, talent acquisition and internal training every year. What's funny about that is that's actually greater than what the federal government spends on higher education through the Title IV program um, by about uh, close to 40 to 50 percent, right? So the money is already out there. It's just being deployed in terribly irrational um, and unorganized ways. And so that's really a lot of where I see the, the future coming is that employers are going to be more engaged. Um, education is going to be a much more of a lifelong pursuit. And, and if we can do that, we can actually save money for society as well. Can I add something to this? Because I really, I really agree with uh, what Jake was just saying. There are hundred, over 100, 150 actually billion dollars in corporations spending money on these programs. So together with his call for corporations to be a little bit more thoughtful and effective in how they train, how they work with companies like General Assembly, I think we need to start much younger. Right, because what you see here is the pre-K to whatever, 70 year olds, right? They, any, it's not just young people that go to General Assembly. It's everybody who wants to really improve their skills to get a job in the digital economy, in the knowledge economy, in the constructionist economy that I call. And that's amazing. But there are actually maybe $40 billion in the K-12 system in the United States alone and a lot more globally that is being spent on creating and buying materials, instructional materials, textbooks that are no longer relevant, even little apps that I call pop computing that are really useless, right? And so we need to start thinking about uh, the kinds of skills and literacies we need to create so by the time they really go to high school and go to college, they even seek the courses that maybe Jake didn't take when he went to Yale, right? And maybe he spent a quarter of a million dollars on education that was not really the right education to be employed in that economy. So what the problem is that there are a lot of poor kids, poorer kids, they can't afford General Assembly, right? So we have to really, we, we do have to find education and government system dealing in the K-12 in such a way that kids get it for free, the teachers are being trained for free, but the system pay for companies like ours to come and really provide this education, right? But the other problem is with General Assembly, just to be provocative and get Jake to kind of like respond to this, is that I hired a few people from General Assembly after the three months courses that they did, and it wasn't enough. I still needed to invest in their skills versus some high school kids that took my courses who work for me for $15 an hour and they're doing amazing jobs simply because they took two global oral courses that are actually more savvy than some of the General Assembly graduates because some of the skills that they learned in General Assembly are not enough. They're actually a little bit, a little bit pop, right? They're a little superficial. They're just a good 
starting point, and I think General Assembly still has a lot of more work to do in getting deeper and broader into more demanding courses that really will be a replacement of what community colleges and colleges offer today and be a little bit more thorough even within corporations to provide education that can really train employees to do the jobs that we CEO need them to do. Jake. <laughs> well, uh, I would say that you know perhaps it was those high school students not being corrupted by college educations yet that, that made Th that's that. true. Or maybe they were prodigies. <laughs> uh, you know, I would say they're not. I would say in general, uh, the NPS of, of of what employers say about our students is fantastic. Um, I, the thing I'm most actually proud about is that. Uh, <laughs> is that you know, we've started to see companies like Coca-Cola on our corporate website list General Assembly as a requirement or as a, a sort of alternative to other degrees as a way of, of, of sort of de defining what kind of background they want people to have. And that's out of their own personal experience. Um, the other thing I will say is that you know, as, as you can see right here, um, you know, this debate about what technical skills are, what are required, what matters and what not is a, is a very opaque issue and every employer that I know is dealing with this. Um, and what you'll see at General Assembly is we've put about two years very quietly, about, about $3 million to work investing in an assessment program designed to build a whole new set of, of credentials around skills that will allow for sort of a very even playing field around um, uh, what kind of skills you have and, and where you might want to put them to work. So, you know, I welcome all of your students that have, you know, Gold Warrior to come and, and take that assessment and we'll see sort of how they rank up. Okay. Uh, another question? Yeah. Uh, not the same person. Not the same okay, person. Okay, let, let him. Uh, yeah. Good somebody question. somebody okay. didn't ask a question. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was just going to follow up. Um, when Startup Institute is actually involving. I think there are some amazing Jewish day schools that figured out how to integrate computer science and STEM innovation in Jewish studies or concepts that are key. And I think what, what, what is right about what you're saying is that project-based learning in all ages and all stages, whether they're adults that are being educated or the young kids are being educated, is a very important thing. And getting the practical skills that Jake is highlighting, that we need to start doing these practical skills and soft skills that are about teamwork and communications and visualization that needs to start very, 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 very young. However, what's important is that we understand that the technology, the computer science, the design thinking, the engineering is not, should not be taught in isolation. And some Jewish day school that I'm trying to work with don't fully understand 
that the integration is actually one plus one equals five, that learning more in integration is easier than learning them in isolation. And they forget that they can do a lot of STEM and a lot of engineering in their Jewish studies, in their Israeli studies, in everything that they do about Shabbat, when you can really use design thinking and, and appropriation and customization and personalization and really tie in that, that new technology with whatever the Jewish day school goals are. And that's about educating the leaders. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. okay, we are out of time. Thank you very much.